You're listening to Trek FM. Want to join in the conversation and share your thoughts on this episode? Join the Babel Conference, our listeners' discussion group on Facebook. Just type B-A-B-E-L into the Facebook search field, and we'll look forward to seeing you there. This is Steve Sansweet of Rancho Obi-Wan, and you're listening to the 602 Club. Welcome to the 602 Club, Trek FM's local watering hole. So excited to be here tonight. I'm not really sure what decade we're in. And Nixon is president again? Oh my gosh. Christy, what is going on? And the nose got even bigger this time. That is so true. That is, uh, it's, <laughs> it's like each time he gets to be president again, maybe he's like Pinocchio. The more he lies, the longer the nose That's gets. That's it. That's it. There you go. Uh, well, we're so excited to be here tonight because we are finally going to dive in to Watchmen from Zack Snyder. What was considered to be the unfilmable has been filmed, and we thought it would be great to finally get into this one. And honestly, I couldn't think of a better person to get to guest on the show then a man you may have heard on a podcast called The Suicide Squad Cast. His name is Scott, and he not only knows DC, but he knows Zack Snyder Films. And so I'm very pleased to welcome to the 602 Club for the first time, Scott. Thank you so much for having me. This is kind of exciting. I'm geeking out a little bit over here in the corner. So just if you hear any squeeing, just, you know, move along. <laughs> this is not the squeeing you're looking for. <laughs> Oh, uh, everyone! If, if if anyone knows me, I am I am enthusiastic to a fault. You know, it it takes a lot to make me bummed, and then when you and then it's like, ooh, something must be wrong. <laughs> well, that's good. But well, yeah, I'm just I'm, I'm really excited to be here. I've been listening to you guys for a long time. I think I first started listening to y'all around the time that Suicide Squad came out in the theaters the and then i kind of went back and listened to some of the old shows and have kept listening so it's great to finally this is how podcasting the twitter world works you finally get to actually meet people well it's pretty fun it's like yay you're a real person <laughs> you're not just a dis franchise voice out there in the middle of the ether <laughs> <laughs> oh it's it's i'm so glad to be here Awesome, man. Uh, well, before, of course, we dive into this epic film, uh, just want to remind everybody, of course, you can find us all over the place. Wherever you get your podcasts, you can find the 602 Club. But if you happen to be over on Apple Podcasts or iTunes, give us a star rating and review. Let people know what you think of the show. It definitely helps people find the show as well when they're searching for podcasts. So we really appreciate that. And then Whenever you do, uh, we read your review out, no matter what it says, on the podcast. And thank you for spending your time to do that. Uh, you can also find us on Twitter, at TrekFM, or on Facebook at Facebook.com slash TrekFM. You can also go over to Trek.FM, which is our main website. See all of the shows we do, because we have so much coming out here. You can go to Trek.FM slash contact, because maybe you want to email us. Christy and I love getting emails, so go over there and do that. Just choose the show choose the 602 club and that'll come to christy and i and then last but not least maybe you would like to join in the conversation with the larger listening audience of trek fm and you can do that on facebook we have a listeners only discussion group called the babel conference two ways to get in if you're on the website hit discussion on any of the menu bars or you can go over to facebook and type babel into the search field there and we'll let you in so I wanted to start here with this, with our Watchmen experience, because this is not only a movie, but it's a comic, and it's a comic that is so well-known that Time put it on its 100 greatest novels of the 20th century. And so this is a pretty important comic. So I, I just wanted to, to judge the room uh, and to kind of see where everybody was with their Watchmen experience when they had first read the comic and when they had first seen the movie. What about you, Scott? It was the summer The Dark Knight came out. I, I I remember it very clearly because the first trailer for Watchmen was in front of The Dark Knight with Smashing Pumpkins playing. And I remember watching the trailer 
And when the title came up and it said Watchmen, I was working at Barnes and Noble at the time. I, I worked at Barnes and Noble as soon as I got out of college until I decided to go back to school and, you know, get a real job. And when I saw the title Watchmen, I went, oh, that's what that's about? Because I had seen the book sitting on the shelf at the graphic novel section. So once I saw the trailer, I just picked it off the shelf and on various lunch breaks over the course of about a week, I read it on my lunch break. And that's how I experienced the novel for the first time. So what what, what was that? That was 2008, if I'm remembering correctly. So that was the first time I read the graphic novel. And then when 2009 rolled around, I saw it opening. I saw the movie in theaters opening day. That is nice. so cool. Nice. So what what did you what when you read the comic, you know, for the first time, it's it's a pretty interesting experience. It's one of the most unique comics out there. What did you end up thinking of it? I I you know, the the cliche of mind blown came to mind. I th- when you use the when you use the term graphic novel, this more than anything else, I felt like really at that time for me encapsulated the novel part of the graphic novel, especially when you read all the supplemental material that gets added on at the end of each ish of the of each issue throughout the book. And it was full of references and allusions that it would take me another two years to really dig into, like the music references and stuff that I wasn't aware of at the time. But that was what got me was I felt like this is as close to reading a book as a comic had gotten to that point for me. Christy, what about you? Because I'm really interested to hear, you know, where you're coming from with this one. So I'm actually on the opposite end of the spectrum from Scott. I had seen the trailer, I remember, when Dark Knight came out, because I did go to the theater for sure to see Dark Knight. Um, But I just never got around to seeing the movie um, until we were planning on uh, reviewing it on the show. So the first time that I've seen that movie was this weekend. Um, And I've never read the graphic novel, although I love a graphic novel. Um haven't read this one yet, um, but I am a DC Comics fangirl, and my favorite character has always been Catwoman, so i got to give a DC shout-out. Just saying. Awesome. I can respect that. No, I'm excited. I'm so excited then for you to get a chance to read this, because I think it'll be one of the most interesting experiences, because this is a comic that has a very big impact on the comic universe, and especially, I think, even the DC universe as you move into the 90s and into the 2000s with its comics and even all the way through, I think, New 52, you can really see a lot of influences that this kind of, it just water, it's a, it is a watershed comic, you know, like it changed everything when it came to comics and I didn't read it, I don't think until about 2011, the first time and Mm -hmm. I would say that my first experience with the comic was good, but it wasn't like, I don't I just don't I don't know if I wasn't in the right mindset or whatever, but rereading it, I read I reread it um before I watched the movie again. And it was just a much different experience. I just don't know if that even that amount of time from then to now has changed me enough to really kind of appreciate the genius of it. And and so that was a really interesting experience for me. And then you know, the movie itself, you know, I've seen it a few times now. And so I actually don't know. I cannot remember if I saw this in the theater or not. But it was a movie that I watched. And then I've rewatched a couple of times. And I think this might have been my like third or fourth time to, to see it, you know, rewatching it for the podcast. I will actually say I felt like reading the graphic novel before seeing the theatrical cut of Watchmen hurt my experience watching Watchmen in the theater. Oh, really? I I am what I'm an English teacher. That's my that's my that's my trade. I literally have a t-shirt that my parents made for me that says the book is better. I'm I'm one of those people. <laughs> and so it was really hard for me when I went to see the theatrical version just realizing how much was cut out of the story from the graphic novel. 
and it it felt like it and I didn't know the story behind why that was the case or that there was this director's cut hanging out there or not. So anytime I, I see an adaptation, I may I read the book first before I see the movie. No matter how many times that hurts the movie going experience, I always need to read the book first. And so this happened. Then when I went and saw it a second time with my father, I what usually happens, I'm harsh the first time and then I lighten up the second time. So you always have a, a bad movie going experience if there was a book first? No, not always. Because sometimes okay. the movie, I can see a movie and I'm like, they nailed it. And sometimes I've actually seen a movie and gone, they improved on the book. That happens, that happens okay. very rarely, but it has happened before. But I do sabotage myself because I always insist on reading the book first. I'm right there with you. I tend to do that myself. Like I just enjoy reading the book. And part of that is because most of the times in the end, I do feel like the book is better. You know, it's it's the difference between reading Harry Potter and watching Harry Potter. It's like, I like both. But if I had to choose one that would only exist, I would just, I want the books. You know, it's just, it's a, just a better experience. And, you know, I, I think you're absolutely right because there is a difference between watching the theatrical cut here and just them adding 24 minutes into the director's cut which is what we watched for the movie i think it does make a big difference because you get a lot more of the um things that more was kind of pushing at um in in the novel um in the graphic novel than you do when those 24 minutes are missing because there is so much in the novel about just the overall world of watchmen that helps explain where all these characters are and everything that isn't in that theatrical cut just makes a huge difference. Well, actually, for this podcast, this was my first time seeing the director's cut because I owned the ultimate cut. And that's what I watched. Yeah. yeah. So I because what happened was when the when they started announcing the the home release of the movies, I, I was still working at Barnes Noble and I read in some magazine somewhere, they were already announcing like, yes, the, the theatrical cut, the movie's coming out, but in a year, these other versions are coming out. And so I didn't buy the movie on home video for over a year, even after the theatrical version was released on like DVD. And then when the ultimate cut came out in this beautiful giant black box set with like the motion comic on Blu-ray and the ultimate edition, that was, that was the only version I owned. So I actually haven't seen the theatrical version of the movie since 2009. Cause I watched the ultimate cut, which is like three hours and 45 minutes or something. <laughs> Which that is, a is really interesting because, you know, um, Zack Snyder just did the um, director's cut editions of his films and they had the live stream where they had question and answer afterwards. And, and I remember him saying that for him, he, you know, the ultimate cut is fine, but he likes the director's cut the best, which I, which I thought was really interesting. What I had heard before secondhand, but it was really great to hear from him his his thinking behind that and 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 he and he because he doesn't bash the ultimate cut he's like no i i always wanted that to eventually get out there but the director's cut is the version that i storyboarded and so when i heard that explanation Mm -hmm. i was like well that makes complete sense to me and you know he's even said in other interviews that you know he he doesn't he doesn't mind the ultimate cut existing. I mean, he had to make it happen. I mean, he had to shoot the interstitials with the with a newsstand and the boy reading the Black Freighter comic. So, I mean, it's not like he didn't want it to ever exist. So, it, and I like it how he's kind of like, choose your own adventure. Watch the one you prefer. Yeah. Yeah, I did read in the um, just synopsis online as well that a lot of people's problem with the theatrical version was the absence of the Black Freighter, which is in the... Uh, graphic novel yeah actually when the movie came out to kind of to kind of deal with that it they released tales of the black freighter as its own separate animated movie that you could buy on home video you know back in the day this was like a big 2000 thing where they would do like these these sort of independent dvd releases that would coincide with a big theatrical release and Tales of the Black Freighter was one of those, and you could also get like a little mockumentary, like 
under the hood. And it was all the actors in character, like all the original Minutemen. And it was like a faux documentary about their lives as the Minutemen. And I was totally like geeking out. Like when this movie came out, I was in the hype for it. That's yeah, so it's cool. really, I mean, I love that, you know, we're watching this director's cut because for me personally, one of the things that I've kind of come to as somebody who enjoys films is wanting to watch the movie as the director themselves wants it to be seen, you know? So, you know, mm -hmm. I'm like that with Star Wars, you know, that's the way George Lucas wants it. I'm going to be okay with that. I'm not going to complain about the way the director wants their movie to be, you know, seen. And so the fact that, you know, this for, for Zach is the one that he storyboarded the one he wanted people to be able to see makes me happy. And I, I do think um, it's, it's probably the best version of the movie. I haven't seen the ultimate cut, but it, this one just feels, you know, after having read the comic right before seeing it, I think it does a pretty decent job of of giving us the movie. And and one of the things I think is so interesting about this this whole thing is, you know, the world of Watchmen creates that alternate history in the 80s, you know, these previous masked Avengers, you know, you have a more recent group of Avengers who have kind of uh, had taken up the mantle and and now they're not working anymore except the, for the few who are working for the government who you know we were joking at the beginning nixon's three terms in now because he's working with dr manhattan who you know um who has helped him be able to get three terms and we've won the war in vietnam because dr manhattan has intervened and it just creates this really interesting thought idea of what if this had happened instead of this and just the setup of the world of Watchmen is something that again rereading the comic I was really glad that I did because getting back into it here in the movie I th I think that Zach does a pretty good job of creating that milieu yeah I what I think really is interesting about it is that he used music so incredibly well. He used music that invoked the periods and that either – and most of it was actually songs directly referenced in the graphic novel, which I loved because, you know, you get Billy Holiday's You're My Thrill. You get Jimi Hendrix all along the Watchtower. I mean, these are all songs that are actually directly referenced in the graphic novel, and I think it just gives a sense of time – the sound of silence when the com at the comedian's funeral. It's like it, it it sets it in its period. Like you know the world that these characters exist in by associating it with the songs of the time. I can see that. I I felt like it definitely the songs fit for the time period that they're trying to invoke, and I I loved the world building of the. Um, title sequence for sure when they're showing the Minutemen and how the Watchmen are interacting in the world and you know how Nixon gets three terms and everything um, it, for me though I felt like some of the songs were a little on the nose um, even though maybe they were referenced directly in the graphic novel I think maybe they could have been more creative with the score um, putting it together to to fit the scenes, not just in like the name of the song or that the, the song was from that time period. The one that, that I always, and I, I know why it's there because, you know, um, it's, it's, it's referenced in the novel, but you know, the one that always kind of stands out to me because I don't, I don't enjoy that version of the song is hallelujah. Oh yeah. I'm, I'm there. I, I will, I will co-sign that. So that one always, because I mean, and that scene is so thematically important with what's happening with the characters in that moment and what's just happened. And it, it's a, it's it's a big I mean, that's a that's a very much a part of what um, Alan Moore was was talking about with these heroes and why they put on these masks and, and what all this means. Um, it's just that that version of that song it's not enjoyable to listen to personally for me. And, you know, if they'd had the Rupert mm -hmm. Holmes version, uh, I think that's who it sings, maybe can't remember anyway there's a there's another famous maybe it's watson i don't remember 
I should have looked it up. But um, there is another version on a song that's more famous um, in the sense that it gets played more often, like on the radio. And I really enjoy that version. And it's just more melodious. And I, I would have enjoyed that for that scene specifically. But yeah, that's the one that really stands out to me as just being just not my favorite. So, um, mm-hmm. I, you know, it, one of the things that really interesting, because, you know, we're talking about this idea of the way the world is built and um, the the place that we, we have this movie. And I thought one of the things that also was really well done in the, in the movie is the fact that we're dealing with this question of like power and, 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 and the struggle of power and how it's used. And when you, um, when you have it, do you use it well? Do you use it rightly? Do you use it wrongly? What does it mean to have the power of quote unquote a God, political power, people who put on masks and what we do with all that? And I was just really struck by the way each one of these people deals with either the power they have or the power they don't have. And I really appreciated rewatching this film because I felt like talking about that idea, it, it feels so much more relevant even now than I think when the, the book came out and even when the movie came out in 2009. Yeah, I, I, can, I completely agree with that because, you know, Alan Moore has some interesting ideas and I think I'll, I'll, I think I'll leave it there. He has some interesting ideas for, from my personal perspective. But one thing that this book really does well, and it requires a, a decent knowledge of the Cold War. I mean, if you don't understand the time period and the polit- and the political spectrum that is sort of behind it, you 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 can maybe understand what the movie's saying, but I don't think you get a full appreciation. I think that's what maybe hurt this movie when it first came out was by the time this movie came out, there we have a whole generation that doesn't remember what the Cold War was or what the Cold War was like, and that the fact you have Doctor Manhattan who was literally a walking WMD. I mean, th- I mean, when you talk about the arms race, that's why Nixon is able to solidify his power base so much is that in the arms race, we won. You know, we, the United States, won because we produced the one and only existing superhero, the only person, the only being who actually has powers. Everyone else in this movie, it's cool, is talented, has something, but Dr. Manhattan is the Superman of this world. He's the one being who actually has superpowers. And what happens when a nation controls that and uses that as a weapon? And I think that was something Alan Moore was trying to get at, was trying to get at when he was talking about a very literal sense of power. And even it, like you're saying, Scott, you know, using it as a weapon unintentionally, you know, I mean, in in the end, they were thinking that it was Russia all along in this version of history um, that is going to, you know, provoke the situation. And then they find out that um, they don't know, obviously, that he was framed, but that Dr. Manhattan supposedly caused everything and he was who they thought was on their side of things. Um, so I, I liked that turning of it on its head. Um, but but I do also see the point of where Alan Moore was coming from and even putting the story together of that you can't always trust your heroes. I like that theme of who's going to watch The Watchmen. Um, so it it can be a little bit cynical. <laughs> I think sometimes I like movies and books more to escape from reality than to make things more real and more cynical. But I, I like the idea of thinking about that outlook on things oh i think it's very interesting that this and frank miller's the dark knight returns came out within like two months of each other like oh that yeah. they both i mean like dark knight returns came out and like the month that the final issue was released literally like one or two months later the first issue of watchmen came out and the way that they both deal with this idea uh, i mean if you look at both those books they're both dealing with a American government that has outlawed vigilantes unless they are working for the government. And what do those vigilantes do when they're not 
they've gone beyond just being on the wrong side of the law. They're on the wrong side of the United States government and how does the government treat them? It was it was so much in the zeitgeist that two different writers came up with similar ideas, but then went in completely different directions with them. Yeah, that's something that I think is really fascinating because, you know, we have the different, you know, types of power in the movie, but we also have the lack of power and what that does to people. So, you know, just in the general sense of, of the, the Watchmen universe, and especially when you read the comic and, and Zach is able to do as much as he can. And this is the one part where it doesn't quite give you enough, but it's not his fault. It's just because you can't make a like 10 hour movie. Um, is that there is this sense of, of um, powerlessness that is running through all of these people's lives that we see that are outside the, the main characters, you know, the main uh, Watchmen characters that were, you know, following their lives. It's all these other people whose lives we're following. We're kind of like seeing this, this idea of powerlessness, but it really gets portrayed here in the movie. And it, and it became this thing where I was really struck by the, and I put it this way on purpose because it, it plays into that scene we were talking about with Hallelujah, but the impotence of powerlessness where you have people who feel so powerless that it is impacting every single part of their lives and every, every part of their being of who they are um, and that the only way that they feel powerful is to take into their own hands um, what they see not happening in the world and and the evil not getting confronted and to put on a suit to do something about it. And that's something I thought was was really interesting. We we obviously see that in Rorschach's character, but we also see that in Dan's character and they kind of have an interesting mirror of each other of this this feeling of like they this powerlessness. Dan has a much more much harder time I think getting back to the fact that he needs the suit to feel powerful because it, it gives him a sense of freedom that he doesn't have and, and a freedom to do something about the world he sees decaying around him. Rorschach is the one who like completely understands, no, I have to be sold out to this because this is what keeps me, what he thinks, like almost this is what keeps me sane in, in a world that is insane. And I just I love the way that we deal with those complexities because it is so much deeper than you know your average everyday comic book aka comic book movie you know well i think something that the, the once again like you said the movie really couldn't do this because it can't go through all the little side stories but when you do get some like this but even the civilians like dr manhattan's colleagues that you know have just completely turned on him because of the way that they see what the world's become because of him and then what they think that he has maybe unintentionally, once again, he's framed, but how it's negatively impacted their lives and how they, they, how they react almost in a sense of they're trying to take their world back. And by doing it, by going on the talk shows and railing against them in, in the media, it's a way of them trying to get, trying to empower themselves against what they see as the ultimate power. Right. Because what else would you do? <laughs> <laughs> well, what else can you do? They can't overpower him. Right. But I, I yeah, I like also um, what, what you were saying, both of you, about the, the powerlessness, in particular with Rorschach. I feel like he ends up becoming the only character that I can empathize with because it's like at least he has some kind of a moral code, even if he's crazy. But I, I like how they show in the movie, especially that things like this always stem from somewhere and that Rorschach's whole personality comes from being treated as, you know, so powerless and insignificant as a kid and that, you know, he didn't even know his father's last name and his mother didn't care about him. And then he got bullied. Like it was just over and over and over again, always being put down. And then, you know, it, by, like you're saying, Matt, the contrast with Dan, I like that then they become friends and that even though Rorschach is kind of crazy, that he still has a respect and a care for Dan for some reason and nobody else. Yeah, and that's something that we only get hinted at, at the, in the movie, but that they were partners back in the day and, you know, that they worked together. Um, and I think one of the things that I absolutely love 
Um, Scott, you're bringing this up, and I think this is great. You know, the fact that, you know, everybody reacting to Dr. Manhattan, and of course, he's being framed. Nobody knows this, but it, it just seems so classic. How many times today do we have a story come out and then just wait? Nope. Wait for it. Wait for, oh, it was fake. You know, like it, it, this movie is, is, and, and this comic was the beginning of like understanding what fake news is, like made up news to, hurt your 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 enemy uh in a way that they can't overcome because of popular opinion because you've shaped that with the media this does that so well and then you know i think it's what's so fascinating with rorschach you know i'm with you christy he's he's one of those characters you you can sympathize with so well and it's so strange to sympathize with him because he's so extreme but then you Mm -hmm. see the world that he lives in and you can almost understand that extremeness when you think about people getting away with the things that he's seen people get away with. Murdering of young girls and allowing dogs to, like, tear their bones apart, you know. Um, yeah. Th- he talks about the child pornography being rampant. and it's just things that make your skin crawl, you know. And that's the world that everybody is doing what's right in their own eyes, you know, in this movie, you know, like everybody is, is, and it was something that I was like, I was really thinking about this in it, in it. I had to write it down because it was something that, that just really struck me that the world of Watchmen seems like it's been brought on by societal isolation, brought on by the adherence to Darwinian theology whose inevitable result is nihilism. And that's where this movie resides. And that was something that's really just like stuck out to me. Like this is the inevitable result of being in a world where everybody is truly just out for themselves. And this is what we get. You know, this is the kind of world that you, and is, is the, what I love about this picture is, is this the world we want to live in? And I mean, no, 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 I don't want to. But I also think it's, you know, we were talking a lot about like Rorschach and Dan, but I, I, I always see Rorschach and Ozymandias is like the perfect parallels in this movie. Because when you think about that great line, uh, never compromise, even in the face of Armageddon, that's what those two characters are doing. They are, they have a mission and they are not going to stop for any reason. They just happen to be on two opposite ends of the spectrum about what they think needs to happen to fix the world. But what you have are two characters hell bent on fixing the world. Warshak doing it kind of on a, a street level, you know, one, one terrible perverted piece of crap at a time while Ozymandias is playing sort of like the big picture. How can I enact change on a global scale and make the, and both of them think they're trying to make the world a better place. I I completely agree. Um, And I think that there's a, there's a real sense there too, because you, you have this idea of like, if you, if you do have to compromise your beliefs, how do you compromise in a way that doesn't undermine those beliefs? You know, and that's what Ozymandias is, I wouldn't necessarily say he's able to do at all. And it's also the same thing that Rorschach cannot do because he lives in an extreme black and white view of the world. And he is, you know, I would say if for me, Rorschach becomes in the world of Watchmen, he is the letter of the law. There is no grace. There is no spirit of law. There is only the letter. And we, you know, you are punished to the letter of the law. And and you see it every time, like he walks into somebody's, you know, house or whatever, like um, Moloch or somebody else. And he's picked out whatever it is that they've done that's broken the law. He's like, oh, I must, you know, I'm going to look into that further. You know, it's like nobody is good enough because we could never live up to every law perfectly all the time. There is no great. There is no grace with him. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So. Which I think is why Dan and Lori get kind of depicted at the end of the movie. Like they're the ones who kind of get a happy ending because they find that compromise. It's like mm-hmm. they know what's right, but they also realize that if they want the world not to continue on the doomsday clock, 
path is going, something's got to give. And I think that that's why they get portrayed the way they do. They're the characters who find the the gray middle ground between these two these two ultimate extremes, and then Doctor Manhattan that just like peace out. I, who, who, I'm gonna go create my own life. Yeah, exactly. It's like Doctor Manhattan <laughs> is like the ultimate one who's like he just he get he gives up. Dr. Manhattan gives up. Isaac Medeus and Rorschach go on their extreme paths, and Dan and Laurie are just trying to make life work. Yeah. But it's but it's kind of a tragedy, too, because it's like they sort of get their happy ending if they don't think about why. You know, I mean, really, they're technically selling out everything that they believed in, you know, and Rorschach, I felt like, said it best when you quoted scott you know never compromise even in the face of armageddon like he's like these are my beliefs and they're not going to change period and they decided that they were okay with the world never knowing the truth if that meant that this would provide peace but i mean then that means they have to live with that yeah i guess the question is how do you interpret or you know is that something that's gone not at them or do you get the sense that like that they think at the end I'm okay with that. You know, I think I think that's becomes the interpretation of the ending is do you feel like it's gnawing mm-hmm. at them or do you feel like they've made peace with it? Is it the Star Trek think? Deep Space 9 where Cisco says and I can live with it. Oh, great episode. <laughs> yes. You know, in the pale moonlight because there's all this awful stuff that has happened, but it's for the greater good, right? And so he says I can live with it. And and that's I I think you're kind of Chrissy and Scott, I think you're kind of hinting at this, but that Dan and Lori resign themselves to that, that they can live with it if it does mean that there is going to be a better world Um, and that they will keep the secret even though they don't want to because they believe that it will lead to something better. And we'll definitely talk about the end in a little bit. Um, I wanted to ask you guys, because this is something that I... Obviously, this nature of existence gets brought up a lot in this comic because we're told kind of over and over again in the movie, you know, that the comedian has it right, that life is nothing but a cruel joke. And yet, and, and, you know, Dr. Manhattan even kind of believes that about life, that life is an accident. It's a clock without a craftsman. Um, And we get to this point in the movie where, because of that belief system, Dr. Manhattan doesn't have any motivation to care about life anymore. And I thought that that was so interesting because that that nihilism is so deep there. And the answer to that is kind of beautiful. Yeah, I, I felt like it, it really gets to the point where she and Dr. Manhattan, Lori and Dr. Manhattan, are arguing to the point that she has to barrel it down to the barest facts of what is it about life that is so important to save. And, you know, for her, it's everything. It's kind of hard for her to put into words. But then um, for him, I like that it's only by breaking her down that he then realizes what the value is in that. Um, and that that she herself is a miracle because she came from all of this world of bad. So I did love that moment, but it's also really sad how they get there. I mean, it really, to me, it, it's a, a depressing way to think of the world that it could just all be a cruel joke and then it's over. Because in the grand scheme of things, our lifespans have extended over time. (laughs) People didn't used to live as long as we do now, and it's still not very long. So, you know, I, I feel like me as a person, um, my belief system is that it's not, and that, you know, everything happens for a reason. And I justify that by saying everything had to come from somewhere. And what is a body without the soul you know, I I think that this movie does do a great job, though, of making you ask those questions of yourself. I was so happy to hear you say that, Christy, because the entire time you're talking, right before you you buttoned it up, I was like, I'm thinking this. I was, I'm, I'm, this is what I'm going to say, and then you totally just said it. It's like, yes, <laughs> high five, internet high five. 
Yeah. So, no, I, I completely agree with it. I, and But I think when you get to the end, I, what you just said, but it makes you ask the question. It, and it kind of is, is one of those things that when you have a belief system, if you don't question it, how much are you really having to believe that, 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 you know, if, if you can, if I sometimes think that if you, if you have to ask the questions, if you know the answers, then you don't have to believe in anything because then you know the answer. Believing in something is acknowledging there's stuff that I don't know. And then I just have to take it on faith that something else is out there that I just can't comprehend. And what you have in some of these, uh, more sort of darker characters in in this movie are characters who are just, who who think they know and then that's their problem is that they can never if anything gets questioned or if anything gets if if, if their belief if if their if their structure is just tweaked ever so slightly the whole house of cards comes crumbling down because they can't handle it be not being the way they know it is like the comedian exactly <laughs> or Rorschach. I mean, Rorschach realizes that he's in a world that if this is the way the world is, he be- he begs Dr. Manhattan to kill him because it's like, I can't live in that world if I can't if I can't have this letter of the law. This is the way it is structure. The, th- the thing that really kind of blew my mind was the way in which like you were talking about, Scott, this idea that people just think they know the way it is. And the moment that is so transformative here is to watch Dr. Manhattan realize there is something he does not know, which is very difficult for him because he is as godlike as you can get without being God, even though he's still bound by time. Um, It's his own time, but he is still bound by it. You know, he he can't just do anything he wants um, in the sense that he he doesn't he's not omniscient. Um, and so he doesn't know everything. And so that moment when he realizes who Lori is and how she came to be and the fact that it came from the love of two people who shouldn't ever love each other because of the experiences that they have been through together and what has been, you know, the comedian brought upon uh, Sally Jupiter and the fact that she ends up having an affection and a love for him in return that miracle of those two people loving each other against all odds and creating Lori, who will be the only person that would be able to get Dr. Manhattan to feel at the right point in time, that miracle, like it's, it's, it's the providence of it. And it's so interesting to me because, you know, Alan Moore is a atheist. And yet here, what the answer is, is, the miracle that love exists when it should never have existed. And it almost reminds me of um, the idea in Interstellar where love is the thing that's transcendent. Love is the thing that it transcends space and time. It's the only thing that transcends space and time. And it's the same way here. It's like there's love. And when we think about what this kind of love is, it's like it's, it's, an, it's a love that sacrifices. It's a, it's a love that it's beyond just like touchy feely feelings. Like this, this is, this is true love. And it's, it's ugly because it's put in the context of the comedian and the original Silk Spectre. And it, when we see that and we think about it with what happened with them, it just makes our skin crawl a little bit. But the fact that there was some kind of forgiveness there. And there was a relationship there like it it boggles the mind and and that's because it seems incongruous with everything we know about that letter of the law, you know, from like Rorschach's perspective, but there's a grace there and it, to me, you know, when it came to the idea of existence, the one that scares me is the one that Dr. Manhattan is at before that moment where nothing matters, so it doesn't matter what happens. The world should explode any minute now. who cares? You know, that that's doesn't bother Dr. Manhattan at all. He's like, I'll be over here on Mars. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, it'll be on Mars. It'll be fine. Um, so, yeah, the the whole idea of this like nature of existence thing, it just really it's something that I I really appreciated reading the comic and, of course, you know, watching what Snyder does here. And I think Snyder does a great job with portraying that moment. Um 
I think he does a really good job of, of getting to the, the heart of that moment with Dr. Manhattan and Laurie there on Mars. I think it's, it's really well done. So, well, I think it, once again, once some people use it as a compliment, some people use it as a, as a slight, I tend to take it in a more positive light, obviously being, being a fan of his work, but his ability to create visuals since filmmaking is a visual medium and we're adapting comic books, which are in prose, a visual storytelling medium. And, and just the way sometimes that Zack Snyder is able to take still images from a comic panel and put them in motion but in a way that I still feel like I'm reading a comic book sometimes is for me, it's an achievement. Like it, it, when, when I, when I'm looking, when I'm watching this movie and if I'm sitting there with a graphic novel in my lap and I feel like it, you remember those old flip books that if you just flipped, you flipped it, the image just fast enough, it like made a moving image. I almost feel yes, like that yes. if mm-hmm. I had enough panels of Watchmen, like I feel like that's what I'm doing because I feel like I could just open the book and just follow the movie in the graphic novel because the way the visuals just they just line up and help to tell that story. Yep. I'm glad you said that, Scott, because I, I've always said that I think the best thing a movie can do is show me and don't tell me yeah. because it, it at the end of the day, it needs to be visual. It You need to be able to, to tell me what's going on purely with their actions, not just tons of dialogue. So I, I did love that scene as well, especially for that. Well, and I think, uh, you know, as you guys are talking, I'm thinking specifically just the, the the way that he brought the comic to life in the sense of, you know, they're filming on a back lot, but it looks like crappy old 80s New York. And I was in eight, New York in the 80s and it kind of looked like this. It's dirty and, it, you know, it's just it's not great. Um, And so I really appreciated the way that he was able to do that. And then just the. Even even some of the, you know, some of the design work is slightly different in the movie. Like, you know, some of the costumes are a little bit different um, and stuff like that. But it, it captures the essence of what I think the, the comic was going for. And it really did create a, a whole visceral visual experience to, to put us in this world and make us feel like we're there. And it the movie does kind of make you feel a little bit grimy as you're watching because you kind of get that sense of New York where it's just it's just dirty and everything that's happening around you is dirty and so he's able to do that in such a way and to film it in such a way so that I feel that you know whether it's an action sequence where you know they're beating up people in the uh, the alleyway or whether it's just one of those small moments where people are sitting talking together in a room like uh, Hollis and, and uh, Dan you know, the, those kind of scenes, like each one, I think he's able to just create the visual. And so much of that comes from his respect of the comic. And I think that's really important. Well, I think it. you, you talked about like the brutality. And I, I loved this movie in that the violent – I don't see this movie as glorifying violence. I, I feel uncomfortable with some of the fight scenes. And when we talk, when, and I feel like it ties back to our original uh, conversation about power. I feel like it's su- you're supposed to be uncomfortable about the violence because here are people who, like, we kind of watch Dan and Lori kind of get off on the violence, you know, especially like after their date and they walk down the alley and they get and they and those muggers try to mug them. And I think you're supposed to look at them and go, "What's wrong with you people?" Like, why do you – and it kind of gets back to the whole idea of Alan Moore deconstructing superheroes and going, what's – are these people sick? That, like, do they get off or do they enjoy causing pain to other people? And I feel like that's something that the visuals and the choreography and the sound design – like, it it makes you – Ask that because it just makes me cringe when I watch those fight scenes. Yeah, I think that's a good point because I I do at first think, well, this is just egregious amounts of violence and and 
the fact that I felt like it was pushed on for too long even, but it, from that perspective, it would make sense for it to be that way that Alan Moore is trying to say that these people have something off with them inside their brain because they're into that kind of thing, obviously. Um, so I, I like that you said that. Um, I think, too, it it really reminded me of uh, the movie of Sin City yes. in that it's got that like uh, noir feel and like you were saying, Matt, that it's everything's dark and dirty and just makes you feel grimy. Um, I'm, I do think they did a great job with making it feel like that. And like you're seeing everything from possibly Rorschach's point of view. Well, I think one of the things that I appreciate about this, and I think it's stronger now, and Zach said something about this when he they were doing the live stream, when they were doing his director's cuts, you know, this deconstructing of comic book movies, you know, not you know, Alec Moore was doing comic books but in many ways Snyder does this movie and it's a deconstruction of what we have now as comic book movies and when I think about the you know overabundance of comic book films that have come out and we kind of cartoonize all of this violence that happens to people you know if if you hit a person a certain way they don't just fall down, you know, like <laughs> right. bones break. And I think that's the thing that this movie does is that it's more realistic with the violence of when you hit somebody like this, no, their knee pops out and a bone comes out. And like, you know, um, it's kind of the way in which I appreciated the the way uh, the, uh, the DC universe has done some of their shows. And then the Marvel universe on Netflix did their shows where it's like, no, the violence is is actual violence. It's it's it is violent. It's got blood. It's got <laughs> bones. It, it it you know things break. And that deconstruction of of I, I feel like do I get off on watching this too much? Like when I'm watching a comic book movie and somebody's getting their ass kicked and I'm just like enjoying it too much. Um, but I'm you know, but we've cartoonized it enough and it's CGI'd enough that I don't really think about the what you know, like I think that that this movie does a great job, especially in light of our golden age of comic book films, where it does kind of have to make me stop and think, okay, what do I like about this genre? Why do I watch it? Am I, am I watching it from the wrong reasons at all, you know, and, and those kind of things. And I, I really appreciate that this movie, I think, again, now is even more relevant than it was back then because of all that. I think it just goes back to the fact, I mean, it is such a cliche, but sometimes cliches are cliches for a reason, that this movie was ahead of its time. Like, it foresaw, you know, Alan Moore's graphic novel was a comment on, you know, the Silver Age, what had come before it. And this film almost more so predicted what comic book, like kind of warned us what comic book movies were going to become. Because there was a, there, there was a time, there was a time before, uh, to quote another Zack Snyder movie, where you had to wait two to three years before you saw another comic book movie. And now we get like five, six a year. And it, and you're right. You, because of the inundation, you sometimes wonder, are you getting desensitized to what these stories kind of promote? And do you forget that sometimes this stuff is supposed to be kind of scary? And that's what I think this movie does. And I never thought about the movie as a deconstruction of comic book movies. The way the graphic novel was a deconstruction of comics, I that that's a great way that I hadn't viewed this film before. Well, it's not original with me. You can think, Zach. Well, I've, so. I, as, <laughs> with most things, of course. I thought it would be great um, quickly just to kind of talk about the cast and um, you know the ones that really stood out to you. What you know, if you felt like they did a good job in the roles. And if, you know, there was anybody on the other side that you felt like, ooh, you know, they're not bad, but I feel like they could have maybe gotten somebody better. So I've got to say the standout people for me in this movie were definitely Jackie Earl Haley as Rorschach. And um, I, I felt like, honestly, Dr. Manhattan, because 
A, I love Billy Crudup. And then two, before I even saw this movie, I had heard of Dr. Manhattan and obviously seen the blue glowing dude. Um, so I, I was already fascinated with what is this guy's story? Um, but I, I, I've never been a fan of Malin Ackerman. She just bothers me. I'm, I'm, I can't, I, I, I can't you know, argue with that. Jackie Earl Haley. Absolutely. I mean, he's one of those that like, whenever I read Rorschach, I hear his voice. Like he is Rorschach. Mm. Like when I think of Rorschach, even the comic, I'm still visualizing him as the character. Um, this movie introduced me to Jeffrey Dean Morgan. So I had I was not watching Supernatural at the time. So I didn't know him as, you know, the Winchester's dad. So I I enjoy him and he seems to be really fun playing those despicable characters that you somehow and still in back to a point you were making earlier Matt about, you know, he's despicable, but I like him. I'm like, why? Why do I like him? And he's a terrible human being. Yeah. If you ever saw Walking Dead and saw him as Negan. Yeah. I, you feel the same way. Totally. Yeah. It's like, I still, ooh, you're bad, but I still kind of like watching you. I shouldn't. I'm a bad, I'm a terrible person. <laughs> um, it's, it's okay. So I like watching him too. too I, I met him here in this movie. Um, but then, of course, I went on to see him in Grey's Anatomy, where he plays a completely different type of character. So nice, like the world's nicest guy. So, you know, being able to see that he can play both sides of the coin was fantastic. I mean, and, and you're absolutely right. He nails the ability to be utterly despicable in this movie. But I think the way that he plays the comedian's turn is so good. You know, when he's crying there in Moloch's bed, and it's like he's he's... There's, he's lamenting the awful things that he's done in his life. You you see almost this this type of repentance. Like he wants to, he wants to be able to turn around. He just doesn't know how to do it. Like I, I just that's I think he does it really well because he doesn't have a ton of screen time in the movie, but when he is on screen, he's so magnetic. It, Jeffrey Dean Morgan's a national treasure. I think Patrick Wilson does a True. great job playing an everyman. Uh, I actually a little backstory about me. I'm 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 a theater I'm a theater kid. I, I I did musical theater for a while. So my first interaction with Patrick Wilson was he was he played the Robert Carlyle role in the Broadway musical adaptation of The Full Monty. So my first introduction to Patrick Wilson was listening to the cast album of The Full Monty, and so then to see him do this, it's like wow, you nail blue collar like really well. And then it, it, and he makes it, and he makes Dan seem so put upon that at, at one point I just want to slap him across the face and go buck up, pull up your bootstraps and get out there and do something. And other times I just want to sort of pat him on the head and go, there, there, Dan, it's going to be okay. <laughs> yeah, you totally nailed it on the head. I, I feel so sorry for Dan. And I think that Patrick Wilson did do a, a wonderful job. Actually, it's funny that you said you first know, know him from theater because I first saw him in Phantom of the Opera. Ooh. Oh, that's right. The Joel Schumacher film. Alongside Emmy Rossum. Yeah. So it was it was interesting. I think he's excellent in this movie. He is Dan. Like he is the comic book mm -hmm. personified. And that's what's so great. I think even, again, kind of referencing what Zach said about him, he's like, Patrick is Dan. There, there was, there was no other way to do that. And then, of course, it was so interesting because um, this last weekend we had people over and we had some friends who had not seen Aquaman, so they watched it. And seeing him play that role, you know, where he's like the uber confident, you know, all of that, and then to see this role where he's this demure, almost mousy type guy because he just feels so impotent without his suit. He's a you schmuck. Know, it, it, Yes, yes, yeah. he's absolutely a <laughs> schmuck. So I completely agree. Like, I, I think everybody nails it in this movie actor-wise. I am with you, Christy. Malin, she's not my favorite either. She's not awful in this movie, but I don't, I don't think she brings a gravitas to the role that I really want, um, especially with some of those scenes with Dan. Her scene with Dr. Manhattan on Mars is not bad, but I do think it could have been better if you had had an actress with just more range. Um, yeah. 
again, she, and it, but the, the thing is, is she looks the part. And so mm-hmm. that's, she, that part, I mean, it looks just like the comic pretty much. I mean, you, you do get Lori. Um, the other one, Matthew Good as Adrian is okay to me, but I also mm-hmm. wish that he had more, I feel like he needed more gravitas on screen. Like he just needed to eat up the scenery without even having to talk. And Matthew Good does not do that. See, this, I, I, I was chewing on that because I was going to bring him up because I remember watching, it took me about a season of Downton Abbey to go, that's Ozymandias. <laughs> and I feel like he, I agree. Cause even in Downton Abbey, he, He's so likable. He's playing upper crust, but he's so likable that he doesn't come off as like haughty enough to be yeah. the most brilliant man in the world. Yeah, I felt like it, he was a little bit wooden. I felt like he could have shown more range in his facial expressions and been more like you're saying, Scott, like haughty and um, entitled and just more faster and more intense. Yeah. <laughs> it's time for my Lucas oh wow project. you just used george lucas on me okay oh but george you know lucas it just needed more needed to be directing this movie so that he could just tell him okay i want it faster and more intense it's exactly yeah. <laughs> i love it <laughs> i had to <laughs> uh, well i think uh. it's also when we talk about things that maybe this movie because of the ad adap- the aspect of adaptation always comes up because his is a character who kind of gets short shrift in the in the backstory that you get in the comic book that they don't even really attempt in the movie. Like even in the director's cut, some of the some of the more sort of mind bendy stuff that you get in the graphic novel really just they don't even go there. And I'm not saying it's a fault of the film, but it does. It leaves you wanting with that character some. Yeah. And I think you, it's the perfect segue, Scott, to talk about the end uh, before we get to some ratings here. Because, I, you know, I think that one of the things that by changing the end of the comic, you do really change a lot of the characterization of Deus because there is a brilliance level that we don't actually get to see in a lot of ways because the plan enacted in the comic with the genetically engineered alien to bring humanity humanity together takes so much more than the planning that he does with John with this energy project that they end up turning into, you know, the John bombs. Um, And I think that that's part of the, the change and whether or not it's, you know, does it work as well as what Alan Moore does in the comics? Well, it's, you know, I I have gone on record before in saying the squid does make me kind of roll my eyes in the comic book. Like the, the, the fact that it is a giant squid that just happens to drop in the middle of Manhattan. And so I have on record said, I like the bomb. I think it's neater. I think it's cleaner. I think as far as adaptation goes, I felt like they needed to make that change for the movie. But I do miss, because it's in all of that interstitial material at the end of the different issues, as you're reading the graphic novel, you see that plan come together, but even you don't, as the reader, understand what the plan is until it happens. And I think that does add just a a genius level to Ozymandias that you can't, you do not achieve in the movie. Now, Christy, as, some, as someone who hasn't read the graphic novel, do you even know what we're talking about? I'm guessing that you're talking about the scene toward the end where the bomb actually explodes in Manhattan. Yes. It. Do you mind spoilers for the graphic novel? No, but I'll still go oh, yeah. read it. It, it. When the, quote, explosion happens, instead of it being like these little mini Dr. Manhattan explosions, there is literally a giant blue squid in the middle of the city And the story that gets perpetrated is that this is an alien invasion. This is an alien attack. Uh, Okay. I get it. But yeah, I I agree with you. I think that the way they did it in the movie was a little bit better. The one thing that did bother me about that scene, though, was that I don't think that they gave you enough visual of 
why it was there. I don't think that it it really ever tells you why the bomb is in that part of the city, how it got there, anything. Because, I mean, when you initially see it and Dr. Manhattan working on it, you don't know where that is. But, I mean, they could have told you at some point. Yeah, I I, know. I see what you're saying, too, because I was thinking that to myself. And then I realized, oh, he's transported them there. But, you know, that, that you have to put that together. So this is this was the struggle that I came to because I thought that I liked the movie better until I got to the end of the movie and Dan says this line to Lori. He says that as long as John is still watching us, as long as people think that John is still watching us, things will be okay. And I thought to myself, has that really worked? before in human history i mean you know the idea of god hasn't stopped us from doing really awful things and turning into awful people so is it just the fact that we know john exists that helps um and i I, so i came to a real struggle with that because i thought it was a it was better possibly until i realized that maybe i would have just liked snyder to have taken the alien plot and made it look less silly and more plausible, which I think you could do. Uh, um, because I do think that possibly the idea of bringing the world together against an alien invasion still brings the world together better than the thought of annihilation by a godlike being. Um, so I don't know. I, I'm stuck. But I see both sides, and I'm still not sure which one I like better. This conversation has now just made me want to go back and read the graphic novel again. It's been too long since I've read Watchmen, and I need to go back and read it again because why I love this movie and this graphic novel is that no matter how many times you read it or how many times you watch it, you're still asking more questions and you find new questions to ask that you're not even sure if you're going to find answers to. And see, for me, I know, Christy, you kind of joked about how, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to think about how awful the world is. And like, see, like, <laughs> this is like, brother bear, brother bear, throw me in that briar patch. It's just like, go ahead. Screw with me. I'm going to, I'm going to enjoy it and thank you for it. Because I <laughs> love just sitting back and just pondering about these kind of things. And the more I can ponder, the more I find it was a better, it was a great use of my time. Mm -hmm. You like the hypothetical questions that don't necessarily get an answer. Yes. Uh, Or let me come up with the answer for myself. You, the film or you, the book don't tell me the answer. Ask the question Mm, and let me have to come up with an answer that works for me. Or that allows me to talk to other people and maybe we can debate and argue in the sense of I want to hear what you have to say and I want to hear what you have to say. And let's kind of, you know, test our own ideas against each other. Uh, The worst thing a movie can do is spell something out for me or tell me because then I'm just like, well, that's no fun. Yeah, I agree with you. I think that the reason that I love movies are when they leave me questioning things or that they they leave me with things that I want to debate with my friends and with family and everything. So I agree with you. I, I think that that's what this movie did best, even though there were things that bugged me here and there that um, I, I think that it does overall leave you with that idea, like we were saying in the beginning of um your heroes traditionally we were told what was so great about them and you weren't supposed to question it. And I like that the whole basis of this is what if they weren't necessarily the best people? What if there's not, there's more than meets the eye to the people you think are your heroes. Yeah. This is making me, you know, excuse me for tangent, but this is just making me think about what Amazon is going to be able to do with that new series they've got coming out in the summer of The Boys. Oh, yes, oh. yes. Uh, with Carl Urban and um, Karen, Fuji- Karen, what's her name? Fujihara. Last? Yes. Yes. Yes, who I, oh, God, I would love for her to return for Suicide Squad, but that. But that, that, but that series and that book, like what Watchmen was for a 
late Cold War era, the boys is sort of this for our post 9-11 world. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that'll be great. Okay. So all of this conversation, talking about the movie, I'm really interested to see where everybody will rate the movie. And so, Christy, I'm really, uh, because you, this is the first time that you've seen it, I'm really excited to to, to hear what you had to think uh, uh, and, and where you would put this on a scale of, you know, whichever scale you want to go up with. Thank you. Um, I, I really, I struggled with it because it, for me, I have to say in, in general, Zack Snyder is not usually my cup of tea to each his own. Um, but it, you know, with the, the slow motion and the um, violence um, I had seen 300 and it, I felt like at the time that I saw 300, it was the first time I was introduced to his work that it was interesting and new because I had never seen anything like it before. And I respect that every director has a, a style they have to make their own. Um, but it just it wasn't so much my cup of tea. Um, but I do like the the source material that creates this movie. Um, I definitely now want to read the graphic novel. And I, I think that there were a really great cast of people, aside from the one or two that we had some issues with, that put it together. Um, so I think really the, the only things that I would change would be a, really the scene with uh, the comedian shooting the pregnant woman. I heard that that was also in the graphic novel, but it still just bothers me. I feel like that's just mean to show on camera. I had a problem with that in Game of Thrones, too. Um and I felt like the the music felt a little too on the nose for me and that I may have liked something more subtle for the different scenes. Um, but it, overall, it was still pretty good. Uh, I think on a number scale, for me, it would be on the lower side. I would do like a four out of ten um, Archies. What about you, Scott? I am utterly... and unequivocally and unapologetically biased. I adore this film up until BVS ultimate edition. I would have called Watchmen my favorite comic book movie of all time because I felt like what other comic book movie can I literally put the comic book in my lap and feel like I'm watching it come to life. It, it, makes me ask questions it 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 captures the spirit of the graphic novel in a way that adaptation I, it, for me it's like adaptation at its best when i talk about the fact that i love books and i always think the book is better but when a movie can make me look at the book and go well heck yeah <laughs> Awesome, which I didn't have that experience with the theatrical version of the film. But after all these years of watching, well, for me, all these years of watching the ultimate cut, you know, with the Black Freighter stuff edited back in, uh, this is, I mean, what other movie will, we make, will, will I regularly go back and watch an almost four hour movie just because I enjoy it so much? And I will. And I don't want to break it up. I want to start it so I can watch like all three and a half hours, start to finish, no bathroom breaks. I mean, that that means a movie has connected with me. And I was there for the hype starting in 2008, and my hype has never ended. I own like two versions of the movie. Uh, you know, I got a steel book. I got the ultimate cut. I've got like multiple versions of the graphic novel. So I am the person that this movie was made for. So for me, on a scale of one to five, it's a five for me because it hits all my buttons. It, I am the audience for this film. So I, I'm coming at it from a completely different, um, a completely different uh, point of view. Actually, I think this movie was my very first Zack Snyder movie. I think I saw this before I saw 300, but I can't. It was mm. either this or 300. I can't remember which one came first. I think I saw 300 first, and that made me a fan of Zack Snyder. And I appreciated him and his style. Everybody knows how much I just completely adore, you know, Man of Steel and, you know, BVS, the Ultimate Edition. 
Um, it's well documented. So I uh, like Scott. I'm I'm quite biased when it comes to my Zack Snyder love. And this is a movie that was really great to go back and rewatch, and especially after reading the you know graphic novel, I really wanted to have that experience of, of trying to see just how close he had been able to get. And I'm with you personally, Scott. I I, I feel like especially the director's edition, it does the best job of bringing most of the main themes from the comic to life in a way that is accessible. I mean, it's, it's a longer movie. It's three hours, but it's still, it's still really well done. And I would say for me, it becomes a four out of five. And that's partly because I'm still working through how I feel about the end. Um, but that's not a knock against the film. I think this is a fantastic comic book movie. And I think, as we were mentioning, it, it, the issues that it brings up in a world where comic book movies have completely taken over the box office, you know, like you mentioned, there's six comic book movies a year. Three of them are Marvel. Two of them may be DC. And then maybe you had, you know, well, I guess it used to be a Fox, but not anymore, you know, so... We're just inundated with them. This really makes us rethink, I think, the idea of of comic book movies, comic book heroes, all of those kind of things, and it just gives us something different and new. And I am like you. I love being challenged um, when I'm watching something, and, and Snyder plus Alan Moore, I think, does that really well. And um, it's something that obviously, he, you know, when you watch his movies now and you see Man of Steel and... BVS, you can really tell how this and the Dark Knight really had a huge influence on him and the way that he tells his comic book stories. And I think that's really neat, you know, that you can trace the lineage. And so, yeah, I'm really excited the fact that we got to do this. You know, this is, I'm going to be really interested to see how people respond to this and what they thought of the movie as well as we look forward to um, releasing this. Uh, and so, Again, hit us up on social media uh, and, of course, on the Babel Conference. We want to hear your thoughts. Really want to say thank you to our associate producers here through Patreon, Ken Tripp, Davis Grayson, Wyatt Millett, and Daniel Noah for supporting the show. Really appreciate that these guys not only support this show here, but the entire network through Patreon. This is a massive network. We have so many shows coming out each week. There's no way that we can do it alone. So we do ask for you to go to patreon.com slash track FM and see how you can be part of our team. It honestly, every little bit helps. Um, there's some great contribution levels you can give at, but honestly, as as much as you can give throughout each month makes a huge difference. So again, that's patreon.com slash track FM. Now, Scott, it's it's been so fun to have you on the show because I've been listening to you and Tim do Suicide Squad cast for a long time now. And to get to have you on here to talk about um, a movie I knew you really liked and to, to get to talk through all of these issues was great. But I want to give you the platform, since this is your first time, tell everybody where they can find you online and a little bit about the Suicide Squad cast and network. Okay, well, uh, you can find me on Twitter at ScottDC27. I'm also on Vero uh, under my real name, Scott McClellan. Uh, have fun spelling that, by the way. Uh, but um, I am the co-founder and co-host of the Suicide Squadcast, the flagship show of the Suicide Squadcast Network uh, and Squadcast Media. Uh, we are a show dedicated to DC, primarily the movies, but we are a news and review show. Every week we talk about uh, the big news that hit. Our big deal is going back to the sources. Uh, we try to be quasi objective but while inserting our opinions but we try to stay positive and we don't get into the rumors and all the oh my god you hear what the latest scoop was we don't care about that we would we actually make fun of that uh but then we also review the movies when they come out and if you are a dc universe subscriber whenever they have a live action show we review every episode every week so we reviewed every episode of titans we're currently reviewing doom patrol at the end of every episode but it's just it's just our attempt to talk about these movies that we that we love that we love so much and occasionally throwing in some some tv and comic book news when it arises but we are also an entire network, so we have three other shows on our network. 
So if you want to hear just about comic books, we've got the DC Comics Squadcast. If you want to hear just about the TV, we've got DC TV Squadcast, and then we also have a general geek fandom news discussion show called Fans Without Borders. There are six of us at the network, you know, and we just feel like we've got a show. Even if you don't listen to my show, I feel like we've got a show for you, whatever your interest is. And that's over at SuicideSquadcast.com is the website to find all the shows. You can find all the different shows and all the different hosts on Twitter. We are also at Patreon. So I'm going to plug us at Patreon.com slash Squadcast Media. We have a – for our subscribers there, we have a Patreon exclusive show where we're reviewing every comic book superhero movie ever made. So we just finished uh, doing RoboCop. And our next recording is going to be on American Splendor with Paul Giamatti. Nice. That is going to be an epic series once you guys are complete. Because that is a I've I've thought about like man, it'd be kind of interesting to go back and like do every single comic book ever made all the way back to like you know Superman and the Mole Men. And, that's until you watch oh. that movie, <laughs> which I did. Yeah, then, and yeah, that's and then I think, well, that's too much. But um, no, I I can vouch for you uh, as a great show, great network, uh, great people, and so definitely do yourself a favor and check them out over at the Suicide Squad cast uh, and the Suicide Squad cast network. So. Uh, Christy, you know, uh, we're about to, as we're recording this, we're about to hit uh, Star Wars Celebration in a week. So mm-hmm. where can everybody find you? Because I know that they're going to be following you with all the news that we're going to have coming out of that. We're going to have a lot of news. I'm going to be doing daily stuff during uh, the week of Star Wars Celebration. So um, for sure, follow me on Instagram and Twitter um, at Bespin Bell. And I did just go on Twitter and followed you guys, Scott. So uh, I'll listen to the Suicide Squadcast soon. Um, and uh, I'm also going to be doing coverage with uh, my friends on the Star Wars Report. Uh, once a month, I do a segment called Fashion in Five for both men's and women's Star Wars fashion. And then, uh, of course, like I said, doing daily coverage on all the Star Wars news for the Star Wars Report, April 11th through the 15th. So uh, I hope you'll find me there. I'm totally going to check this out. This sounds so awesome. You would love a discussion I just did on Patreon. My six-year-old went to Disney World and did Jedi training, and now I've been. Oh, that's awesome. I have been debating. Okay, this pushes up my. Does this push up my timeline when I'm going to introduce him to these movies? And I had like an hour-long discussion. <laughs> it was called "I Am a Jedi Like My Father Before Me." It was all about a dad working out how does he introduce his kids to Star Wars. So I. Oh, that's awesome! You just got. You just want a follower. I just have to say that right oh. now. That's so funny because <laughs> you have um, the hardest choice now too because like you can introduce them to like Clone Wars and Rebels and like all of these things that they didn't exist back in the day and they're like oh there's such great stuff out there that's such a fun problem to have Scott <laughs> yeah struggle of a geek dad ah uh, it's greatness <laughs> well you could find me on uh, Twitter Instagram and Letterbox under the name Matt Rushing Zero Two and of course I'm on Vero as well um, you can find me here on the network doing the Orb with Chris Jones talking about Star Trek Deep Space Nine. I am also over on the Nerd Party Network doing two shows. One is called Owl Post with Drea Kaufman, where we talk about Harry Potter one chapter at a time. And then I do Aggressive Negotiations with John Mills, where every week we talk about a Star Wars topic. If you're a Star Wars fan, this is the show for you. It's just two guys talking about Star Wars the way that you sit around and talk about Star Wars with your friends. So it's so much fun. I hope you'll check it out. And then last but not least, I do a show with my friend Courtney. And it's called Cinema Stories, and that's where we talk about films, but through the lens of faith. But we want to say thank you so much for joining us. And y'all come back now, you hear? Uh-huh.